Hi everybody, my name is Dawn and welcome to What's the Stitch, a web series where I answer all of your burning questions about sewing, costuming, and cosplay. The 1950s and 60s were a golden age of cinema, home to some of the Western world's most iconic classic films. They were known for their sweeping scenery, glamorous styles, and elaborate costuming. Unfortunately, while the costumes were undoubtedly beautiful, they weren't exactly what one would call historically accurate. So this week I wanted to try doing something a little bit different. It's going to be the start of a new kind of sub-series where I take uh, films and TV shows in historical settings and compare the costumes of those shows to what people would have actually worn at the time. I'm calling this series History vs. Media. I thought for our first showing we'd start off with a bang and talk about one of the most iconic films in movie costuming history, and that would be 1963's Cleopatra starring Elizabeth Taylor. A lot of people when they think about this movie think of that absolutely incredible gold dress, but they don't actually know a lot of what went into it. That movie is actually in the Guinness Book of World Records for having the most costume changes in a film, and it was only beat out by Madonna's Evita in 1996. Before we talk about the movie, I'd like to talk a bit about the woman herself, just to give us a little bit of context for where this movie is set and who it was actually about. Cleopatra VII was the last of the Ptolemies, which makes her the last Greek pharaoh to rule over Egypt before it fell to the Romans in 30 BCE. History paints her as a stunning beauty and a seducer of wealthy and powerful men, most particularly Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. The fact is, it's next to impossible to know what she would have looked like, all the images that we have of her, either in coins or in paintings or statuary, were a form of propaganda meant to play up either her Greek Ptolemaic heritage or the fact that she was Queen of Egypt. From the images that we do have, we can say that she isn't actually what one would consider traditionally attractive. Rather, it was her wit, her charm, and her intelligence that made her so incredibly striking. She was fluent in nine languages. Nine! and only relied on an interpreter when speaking with foreign dignitaries. Though the Romans continually threatened her country, her alliances with Caesar and with Mark Anthony helped Egypt remain an independent nation for more than 20 years. Basically, she was a historical badass. We'll just not talk about the family assassinations. <laughs> Anyway, while we can't specifically say what it is that she looked like, we can talk with reasonable certainty about what she would have worn. So now, on to the movie. Let's start with the icon, the gold gown and feathered cloak from her introduction in Rome. As you can see, it's fitted more like a 1960s evening gown, and variations of this design are actually used a lot in this movie. We see simplified versions of it in black, pale blue, green, purple, coral, and white. The feathered cloak is made of gold-painted leather and thousands of tiny, tiny beads. It's incredible, it is. But also, just imagine how heavy that would be. It sold for almost $60,000 at auction in 2012, and really, is it any wonder that they ran thousands of dollars over budget? Now, the real Cleopatra's gown would have been a lot simpler. The Ptolemies ruled over Egypt for decades, but they were not native Egyptians by birth. The Ptolemies were Macedonian Greek, and the first of the Ptolemies was actually installed by Alexander the Great as governor in 305 BCE. They mostly stuck to their Greek roots and wore predominantly Greek-style clothing. This means linen chitons and hymations. Their jewelry would have been a combination of Greek, Roman, and Egyptian in style. I love the headdress in this gown. It's incredible, but it's actually a lot closer to what an Egyptian queen would have worn in a previous dynasty. If we were talking about, say, Nefertari, this would be the perfect crown for her because this is what she would have worn, this incredible vulture headdress. Uh, Cleo would not have actually worn this except maybe in the statuary or murals. And again, just the thing would be so heavy. That with the cloak and the crown, I'm amazed that she could move at all. So it's, it's no wonder that she spent a lot of that time seated on that truly incredible throne, because no one could be expected to move in that. Now on to this purple gown. This is actually the most modest thing that we see her wearing over the course of the movie. She's trying to endear herself to the Romans by dressing like them. The length and the bold color of her pala, which is that lovely red stole that she's wearing, would be a mark of her wealth, and covering the head was a sign of modesty. The, the snug sleeves are 
entirely anachronistic. They didn't have snug sleeves back then and wouldn't for quite a long time. The Roman tunica and stola are loose and open and therefore totally sleeveless. The color though, this at least they have some historical reference for. This rich violet is a reference to Tyrian purple, which I've mentioned in my diecraft video. It was a hellaciously expensive textile dye that only the wealthiest could afford. In fact, one Roman ruler actually made it illegal for anyone except for the royal family to wear this color. So this is definitely Cleopatra flexing her wealth and her station here by wearing this color. Another thing I want to draw your attention to is the makeup. This bold eye paint and the eyeliner, while iconic in temple paintings, would have been considered extremely vulgar in ancient Rome and only courtesans and women of questionable morals wore paint at all. In contrast, here is an image of what an actual Roman woman would have worn. Note the tunica and stola here. They could be pinned at the shoulders or belted at the waist. This lady here portrayed in a Pompeian fresco wears a violet pala or shawl wrapped around her waist and draped over one arm. It was probably weft woven because again, those purples were quite difficult to make and a weft woven fabric would have had uh, red thread on the weft and blue thread on the warp. And you can tell a lot about a Roman station by their clothing. For women, the length and color of their pala tells you if she's a free woman, a merchant's daughter, or a senator's wife. And here is an example of some of the Roman matrons. Now, with the exception of the woman in white, these ladies are actually dressed with surprising accuracy compared to everyone else in the film. The tunica and stola are pretty typical for the time period. The braided embellishments on the ladies in the front row is fairly common, uh, but they're missing their palo. These were worn by all Roman women outside the home. Roman garments were woven from wool or linen, and the finest of these were imported from Egypt, and the very, very wealthy also were garments made of silk. Now, this one here is a really big example of how costume informs character. It is cartoonishly garish. Most Egyptians wore undyed or natural linen in white and pale yellow. Wealthier people could wear colorfully dyed or painted clothing to show off. Um, red, blue, and yellow were the most common in dyes, but shades of purple could also be made. The aqua and orchid that the Chamberlain is wearing is used to make him look as effeminate as possible. It's bad enough that he's singled out as a eunuch, but they had to make him look as unmanly as possible in the eyes of the 1960s public. And that's not even touching Ptolemy himself. He should be wearing a Greek chiton or a hymation, but everything he's wearing is completely oversized. It's meant to make him look like a posturing child in a role that is too big for him. This is in deliberate contrast to what we see of Cleopatra herself, who is very much a mature woman. It's also intended to offer a stark contrast of Ptolemy versus the Romans. Caesar and his men are all soldiers dressed for simplicity and efficiency. As you can see here, out of armor, the Romans' clothing is very simple. Caesar's stola is covered in gold embroidery, and the rich red dye color was used as a symbol of his rank. Now, this here is much closer to what Ptolemy should have worn. The, the tunic is good, but the belt and collar belong entirely in another century and like Cleopatra's crowns, would be something worn maybe only ceremonially or portrayed in paintings or in statuary. One thing that's important to note is that sumptuary laws were a big thing in Rome that were used to identify social class by clothing. Only full male citizens were allowed to wear togas at all, and they could only do so once reaching the age of majority. The toga was usually knee-length, so friendo on the right there is showing a little too much skin, so that's right, no butt curve allowed. Tunics were also short-sleeved until the 2nd century AD. They were decorated with stripes of color called clavis, which varied in color and width depending on the rank of the wearer. For example, only the emperor could wear a purple toga, which is called a trabea. A white toga with a purple band can only be worn by the consul during public festivals and parades. Senators and their sons could wear variations with a narrow purple stripe during these events. This man with the red stripes would be seen as the equites class or an equestrian rider. This is actually Mark Anthony. At that time, he was a powerful general. His stripes should have been gold. Most soldiers in the Roman armies wore white or red tunics. This one that he's wearing here is considerably bolder than what is worn by a standard soldier, even compared to the others in the movie. 
Most soldiers' tunics were dyed with matter. Um, I'm guessing that this wasn't just an effect to show him off, but perhaps it was used with a different kind of dye, historically possibly kermes, which was much more costly. There's no sense in having an elaborate show of wealth like this gold embroidery on a cheap civilian tunic. I could do an entire video on Cleopatra's crowns. They are incredible, and I actually do have a video planned later just talking about the different variations in Egyptian iconography. But in this movie, she has a massive collection of them and I am living for it. They run the gamut between gold flower bathing cap and could have been taken from a temple painting. I mean, look at this snaky goodness. This silver feather crown was reserved for images of queens after the 13th dynasty and it was actually usually used in portraits of goddesses. Note instead of gold that this one is silver. Silver was much rarer in Egypt and actually considered more valuable than gold. Also, it looks heavy as heck. Her neck must have been killing her for keeping that monstrosity upright. Heavy as the head who wears the crown, am I right? In this case, it might actually be literal. The blue crown that she wears here actually looks like a hybrid between the blue Kepresh war crown and the red Deshret crown of Lower Egypt. It looks like in this image that it may have been made of woven reeds, which is actually accurate to how modern Egyptologists believe that they were constructed. And again, we stand the queen. This one, again, is another hybrid between the Kepresh and Deshret, but it's reversed. It's red now. This shape is closer, actually, to what we know as a war crown, but it's the color of the Deshret crown. The starry robe is a lot more modern and honestly looks like it belongs in an Uncle Sam poster. The crook and flail, in addition to the crown of United Egypt, are some of the best known symbols of the Egyptian pharaohs. With the crown, the lower part is made of woven reed and dyed red, and the upper part looks like a bowling pin. Which, for some reason, has been bedazzled here, you know, for the aesthetic. But that dress, though, no, just no. And here we see that dress design again, like the gold one in the beginning. She wears a lot of beaded wigs in this movie, but we haven't seen those actually in use since the beginning of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Um, she would have actually worn her hair in the Greek style, which is bound up in a kind of updo, likely with a kind of circlet or a crescent-shaped crown. Naughty sparkly flowered bathing cap. I only wish that was a joke. Seriously, why? I, I don't know when. If ever, this would have been considered stylish, but I can tell you it definitely was not in ancient Egypt. All right, so thank you all for joining me on this look at 1963's Cleopatra. What were some of your favorite looks? Do you hate the sparkly bathing cap as much as I do? If you enjoyed it, please hit like and subscribe for more videos. If you have any other movies or TV shows you want me to cover, please let me know in the comments. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next week. Thank you.